Hey everybody, it's Pete Renzulli. Welcome to today's episode of The Daily Ticker. And we got David Trainer here from New Constructs. How's it going, David? I'm doing great. Good to be with you, Pete. Absolutely. I love it. Um, all right. So we got three things. We want to get right into it. We want to make sure that everybody understands what's so valuable about today's video. First, we're going to talk about the craze that everybody's talking about right now, which is AI stocks. Anything related to AI is pretty much exploding right now. I don't know if you've seen, David, SMCI Supermicro right now. I believe it has doubled more than doubled just in May alone, just in May, okay? So we're gonna talk about at what point does a stock become irresponsible to chase a stock that's gone up that much, or is the story strong enough that it is worthy of the lofty price from where it was even as of April 30th or however many days in April? Second, we're gonna talk about something that I find absolutely hysterical, which is social media bashing the talking heads and their fiscal responsibility for scaring people to not get long because of all of the conversations around recession and interest rates and all of those kinds of things, including jobs and housing market, scaring people into believing that there was going to be another big crash to the downside, including Michael Burry and everybody else who bet big on the other side of the market. Is it their responsibility or is it the person's responsibility to say, look, the market's continuing to go up, sector rotation in one group, you don't have to look that far, is rocketing higher. Why are you making it more complicated and waiting for Jim Cramer or somebody else to tell you what to do? So is that a fiscal responsibility or just people not normally taking that responsibility on their own? I got some pretty strong feelings about that. We'll touch on that when we take a look at the market. Uh, and then third, we'll bring it all the way back to from overvalued down to, is there anything undervalued that hasn't rocketed higher in the last five weeks? I will tell you right now, as of this recording, right now, healthcare is starting to get a little bit interesting. It had a five-week run up about two months ago. Today, we're starting to see them kind of curl up a little bit. The way that we describe it, though, in our community is it's less bearish, but not yet bullish. So that means we'd be, if we were short, be moving down our trailing stops, but not necessarily getting long. So, David, we'll start out with AI and everything related to the bubble that we're in right now. Yeah, you know, look, it's, it's AI is the new meme stock, right? I think in some ways, uh, and, and the answer to when to jump off the wagon is uh, it's 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 hard to tell. You, you know, it's like, hey, when is someone when is a crazy person going to stop being crazy? Uh, when is a rational person or an irrational person going to become rational? Uh, if you can figure that out, you know, you probably can figure out the keys to the universe. I don't know. Um, it's a tough one. Uh, but I, I think, you know, look, having been in AI for a long time myself, right? I mean, we, you know, our, our technology is built on machine learning. And, and I started doing this in 2003 before there even was a term called machine learning. And I can say over the years, there's a definitely a lot of smoke and mirrors re regarding machine learning. Uh, and only recently has any of it actually had any real practical value. And as soon as they show a little bit of practical value, I think, you know, it, it goes nuts. This chat GPT, I mean, there's, you know, some of the smartest people in the world, the people that are talking about quantum computing and other major technological advances call chat GPT a plagiarism machine, yeah. right? Uh, they don't give it any value. There's actually machine, there's actually other AI that is, looking into whether or not something was written by chat GPT or AI. So like they're, the, the bots are interpreting the bots now that it's gotten to that point. It's going to be, yeah, it's about, it's going to be bot wars soon enough. Skynet's going to take over. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think, I think, um, you know, look, as, as I say, most of the time with all things, maybe I'm a little bit of a broken record about this, Pete, but I, I believe that all, all things, there needs to be some discernment. You know, it's not always easy to decide and find good stuff. It's difficult to make good investments. Otherwise, we'd all be billionaires. So when it comes to the same is true with AI, not all of it is real. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors. It's easy to fake it because most people aren't willing to do the diligence to look into what is actually driving it. That's kind of the whole point. Oh, the machine just does it. I don't have to worry about it. Well, that machine was programmed by a human. Humans make mistakes. And if you do research on, on any of these sort of early AIs, whether it's just Google search or um, suggested search or, or how they deliver results, you know, and all that, there's a lot of human bias baked into it. A lot of the programming that goes into AI is potentially at risk of having that bias or having the same flaws that humans have in other code. Yeah, there's actually a big um, job description right now, which is called engineer uh, prompt engineering 
which they came up with this whole other occupation now with learning how to prompt the AI to give deeper answers. So basically you're not doing any of the work. The real job is trying to get the answer that you want out of the AI, which goes back to what you're saying. You're basically trying to get a biased answer that you're looking for. Yeah, and I think there's a new skill set around how to use AI for sure. Like people who can be smarter about how to use it and get the most out of it. Uh, and big part of that means they have to be discerning about where the AI can be trusted the most. Now, um, because the machines can go through and read everything on the internet, you know, over, over the last 20 years or whatever, I mean, that makes them really smart about content, but does it make them smart about finance? Does it make them smart about accounting? Things that are difficult for humans to understand are very difficult for machines to understand. At the end of the day, what I always like to say, Pete, the big distinction here is that machines only understand what a human teaches them to understand. Right. So if, if, if it's a very difficult and, 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 and expert sort of topic, you got to make sure you've got an expert who's also a programmer or an expert working with a programmer to teach the machine. Those things are rare. And so the machine learning, the AI, the capabilities are very narrowly focused in places where the machines can go and learn it all on their own. When it gets past that, I don't know how much utility it has and how, how sure you can be it's gonna, that it's going to be actually something of value. So a lot of these AIs uh, stuff, I think it's a bubble. I, I agree. I, and actually, one of the biggest things, again, everybody's got to make their own financial decisions. This is all for educational purposes. Um, but at what point when you're about to speculate whether it's an investment or whether or not it's a, a you know a trade kind of more in my universe where it could be anywhere from a week to a couple of months uh, at what point is the re the likely reward potential for the risk you have to take just doesn't make any sense so buying a stock that has more than doubled in 4 weeks at what point does it not make sense at that moment yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's, it's so hard to say because, you know, our analysis will show you when the risk is getting out of control. Um, and we're saying that oftentimes before it even goes on these, some of these crazy runs. So the thing about these wild runs is that they're wild. They wouldn't be, you know, they, they wouldn't be wild if they were predictable. Right, right. It's an inherently unpredictable process, which really just points back to what kind of risk appetite you have. And I think one of the really defining features of our time, feed, Pete, is that you know, this excess amount of stimulus from the Fed and the federal government has effectively numbed people to, to risk. They I don't could not agree risk. more. I could not agree more. We actually had somebody talk about today asking what would change the market to where we should get long and stay long. I said, as soon as you start hearing them talking about adding liquidity back into the market, it's going to be inflating asset prices and you really would have to work hard to mess it up like 2021, basically. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, yes, yes. It will be like 2020 in those times. It's, it's, yeah. When they start pouring money back in, then it's like, what do I got to lose? Right. You don't have anything to lose because you're just going to get more money right. for no work. So that that's a paradigm that I think ultimately is very bad for our society because when we don't have good price discovery and we don't have discernment between good projects and bad, that is a, it's a Petri dish for ripoffs because People can come in and based on narrative, tell you that they've got a good business and they'll take all your money and never give it back because the business doesn't work. And really the purpose of the capital markets, Pete, at the end of the day is to allocate capital to its highest and best use. Its best use is not to line Wall Street and executives pockets. Its best use is to go out there and create value for shareholders. That's what we focus on. Creating value for shareholders is something, you know, from a finance perspective means you're really making real money after all costs. Today, too, too often people confuse that with, oh, the stock price is going up. And that's not a good thing. And we, we you know, Valiant is a great example where you had a, a group of executives that were compensated for stock. And what did they do? They pumped the stock up. What happened to shareholders in that situation? They got ruined. The executives made out like bandits because they could pump the stock in the short term because it could be narrative driven. But at the end of the day, they weren't creating any shareholder value and they were ruined. So discernment today prevents you from ending up like valiant investors tomorrow. There's uh, there's something you said before that we, we can't go unsaid, um, meaning I want to make sure I come back to that, is the, the artificial um, inflation of prices based on liquidity cycles by itself has at this point created a 
mindset where no matter how bad the market gets, people actually believe right now the government's going to bail them out. And that is a scary, scary mindset where you actually, as a professional trader, you're actually sitting in front of the desk sometimes and you're saying they're just not going to let it go down, which is scary because that's not a free market anymore um, where people believe it can't go down. And the people that believe it can't go down are the ones that are going to get hurt the most when it finally does. Yeah, it's a socialized market. Um, and, you know, it's this buy the dip thing and, and nothing ever goes bad, which is why zombie stocks are out there and zombie companies are out there because some somehow somebody's willing to loan a business that's losing money and may never make any money, certainly won't be able to pay back their debt. They're willing to loan them more money. Uh, and as long as people are willing to loan companies money in the form of stock and buy these stocks without understanding the underlying economics, they're putting themselves at a great deal of risk because at some point the music probably has to stop. Yeah. Uh, you know, we can't just go on and just pour throw good money after bad. That will create inflation. And I think that's what's been, you know, what we saw in, in 2022 was where people said, oh, God, the Fed is actually going to put the brakes on this. And when that happened, the car, the house of cards imploded. Yeah. Right. Uh, and right now, people have convinced themselves, oh, maybe the Fed's going to take their hand off the brake. Open pray. Let's get back to it. You know, make money while we can. Uh, but when that hand goes back on the brake. The house, of, the house of cards implodes. And what we always try to say to people, Pete, is, you know, look, you don't have to believe necessarily that fundamentals should be what you focus on 100% of the time. Because clearly fundamentals, we kept you out of a lot of these rallies. Yeah. But you want to at least have it in the, 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 the deck of things or the portfolio of research tools that you look at so you know how much risk you're taking if and when the music does stop. I think there's far too many people now chasing short-term gains simply because it's easier and cheaper to place trades than there ever was before where I, I mean, look, I don't date myself. I got plenty of gray hair, but I remember 20 years ago, it used to cost $200 to place a trade. Now it's basically free, which is getting people to trade a lot more often who really have no idea what true speculation is. The way that we talk about it in our community is that there's a difference between taking risk and accepting risk. And the difference to put it as short term as possible, is taking risk, you're okay with putting a trade on because you think you're going to make money. Accepting risk is believing the possibility that you'll lose that money and you're okay if it pulls back and you get out of it as the cost of doing business. I think there's too many people taking risk right now as opposed to really understanding risk in the context of whether or not there's a probability of profit. And that actually scares me as somebody who's, uh, I guess you could say, an educator and a full-time trader. Um, what people believe the market really is, is scary. I uh, could not agree more. Could not agree more. It is scary and it could end very badly for a lot of folks. And I think you're right. They are, they don't know the risk they're taking. They're driving at night without their headlights. Yeah. Excellent way to put it. So now we have, you know, looking at the market here off the side, I got the S&P 500 where, you know, the entire thing is red other than a small handful of stocks. So the question at this point now is, is the rest of the market waiting to catch up or is the 90% that's red about to drag it down or does it not matter? Just continue to ride the tech, the tech wave. How would, how would you, what's in your mind on that? Just keep riding the tech wave. The party's going to go <laughs> <up> forever. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm, yeah, that's, that's for sure. Not, not my style. Um, you know, look, making predictions on monetary policy and fiscal policy is, difficult to do uh you know it's especially in a world where politicians are in the business of getting reelected and they don't really care what the underlying i think impact on society is because they're getting rich regardless so that's makes it difficult to think about how monetary and fiscal policy will unfold so my approach is look in an uncertain world just do the best you can and, and manage risk reward uh, that's the only thing you can do in an uncertain world and so yeah, we would say, look, you know, we would avoid these stocks with the huge run-ups. You know, I mean, that that um, stock you mentioned, Super Micro Computer, Pete's very interesting because it was a, a very attractive stocks before it went on a big run. You can see, look, great economics and even despite the run, great free cash flow yield. But this huge increase in the price, you know, is going to show you. you can see here, it's, it's, it's a, historically had an attractive rating but it's gone up so much that now it's not attractive. Yep. Why is that? Well, the valuation is impounding an enormous amount of profit growth, more than a hundred years of profit growth. You know, if you're extrapolating consensus 
revenues and historical margins. And I just want to re- I just want to reiterate that for everybody um, to not use market jargon. Um, what David basically pointed up to as that went up towards the top right hand part of the chart, it doesn't matter if you're looking to hold a stock for a week or five years. There still has to be a reason to justify the risk when you're about to hit that buy button. And the reason to accept that risk, again, the difference between taking risk and accepting risk is because there's a likelihood that the profit you're looking at justifies accepting that risk. And a lot of people right now are lamenting the fact that they've missed the move or it's gone too far. And now, unfortunately, there's a lot of people jumping in where there's going to be a lot of profit taking. It's going to end up pulling back on them. So whether you're investing or trading, there still has to be reasons to justify the risk. So again, everything we're talking about is educational purposes, but just really think that through. Is it the right time? If you're about to hit that buy button, is there likely reward that justifies the risk? That's all everybody should consider, no matter how long they're looking to hold the idea, which kind of ties back into the second point that we wanted to talk about today, which was the comical bashing of talking heads where people are saying that the talking heads talking about macroeconomic factors and whether or not we're in a recession and all that kind of stuff scared people out of getting involved in the market. And now people are feeling like they missed out on this particular move. I got a pretty strong take on that. Learn to do your own work. <laughs> I mean, seriously, if if your inf- entire strategy is watching a show at 630 at night, waiting for somebody to give you the golden goose every single night that it changes, you're not going to last. You got to learn to make your own decisions. You have to understand why you're in the market in the first place. So I don't know if you want to chime in on that, but I think it's hysterical, actually, that people are blaming somebody else for them not getting in the market. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that, Pete. I mean, that's that's 1,000 percent. It's um, yeah, people look, you know, nobody wants to take responsibility. Like if, if the same people that don't want to, you know, accept risk. They're not accepting the responsibility of the risk that they're taking, whether they realize they're about to run over a cliff or not. That's the driving at night without headlights analogy, right? You're just hoping uh, that you don't run into a tree or go over a cliff. And I think that the attitude toward risk is very similar to the attitude towards responsibility. I think that's very well said. Actually, in our coaching call last night, we actually talked about the fact that people over the years who have refused to write a trading plan or refused to have developed some sort of an edge, they generally don't create an edge because as soon as the reason they're in the trade is their own, now the responsibility for the outcome is their own. And a lot of people just don't want to handle that responsibility. They want everything to be somebody else's fault. If it doesn't work, but then they're the genius when it does work. So it's kind of interesting how that works. That yeah, way. yeah. I mean, no, I get all the upside without the downside. Yeah. Exactly. I'll take my deal all day long. Exactly. Okay. So we talked about bubbles. I believe we're in a bubble. Um, heading to the other side, where what is reasonably priced these days and why, I guess, is the best way to put it. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, we, I, I would I would point people to you know our our focus list and, and some of the stocks we like. Um, you know, a good a good example is one we talked about here recently is Dr. Horton. Um, you know, a lot of these cyclical stocks are looking a little bit off because you know you're seeing some profitability challenges given the churning in the economy, but the valuation here still looks very cheap. It's a stock that's priced if its profits will decline by thirty percent. Right. That's low risk reward in a business that's been historically extremely profitable and extremely well positioned to do well, despite the overall economic environment. Uh, Owens Corning is another one in the building space that we've we've highlighted recently as a stock we like a lot. A lot of great value. Uh, We see a lot of great value in Schwab. Right. A, A classic, excellent bank, again, trading way cheaper than it's traded in a long time. Um, I've liked Schwab for a while. I think it's a really well-worn business. Had always great quality of earnings. It's, it was expensive. Well, guess what? It's got cheap on us, right? You know, as Warren Buffett's and the great say, uh, you know, the, the, one of the most important elements of, of smart investing is patience. Uh, and I think Schwab's presenting us with a good opportunity. A regional bank that we think could be really interesting as well, Zions Bank Corp. This thing is extremely cheap. Talk about risk reward, 0.2 price to economic book value. That implies the market believes the company's profits will permanently decline by 80%. So whatever additional equity or debt issuance this company has to do, it's not going to have a 80% impact on the future profits of the business or, or the existing shareholders claim 
on the future profits of the business. It's oversold. The baby's thrown out with the bathwater bath water here. We think the same is true with Schwab. So the answer, to my answer to your question, Pete, is, is you know, do the diligence. Look at the risk reward. Find where the markets are still overlooking. Wherever the markets over allocate capital, we call that a micro bubble. You know, and every micro bubble has kind of a an opposite sort of micro opportunity, which is the companies that are getting too much capital means other companies are getting too little. So we look at our system covering you know, 10,000 plus securities. We're looking for opportunities where we think the market has overlooked the opportunity or not assigning as much value, uh, especially relative to the profits. And that's where we see good risk reward. That's where we recommend people allocate capital. Speaking of the banks, David, um, they really haven't been in play for a while. What kind of news would we need to see other than maybe a short, uh, uh, what might be a dead cat bounce here where they've gotten crushed? It's kind of compartmentalized to those couple of stocks. JP Morgan obviously made the acquisition. What kind of news, let's say macro news, would affect that particular industry where they become interesting again, where they would have reason to grow? Pete, this is kind of a philosophical question for me because I, I don't, I don't, I don't know that we should expect an outside catalyst that says all of a sudden banks are going to grow great profits. No, it's not what it's going to be about, and it's really sort of more about, uh, you know, understanding, having realistic expectations for returns and profit growth. And what banks provide us is a great, great platform for growing profits. It's just not outrageous growth, and you're not going to necessarily see 40, 50, 60 percent return in stock prices either. Those kinds of opportunities don't grow in trees. They're unusual. They're a product of a dysfunctional stock market environment. And banks represent what is a more normal and, and, and properly functioning environment, which is lower risk, lower reward, but lower risk. And these days, the opportunity is large because they've been so shunned. They're the anti-popular, right? People asked me a while ago, so similar question to you. It's a sort of, it was something along the lines of, so, you know, why, why, haven't invest, why haven't bank stocks bounced back and, and, and done as well as some of these other stocks? And I said, bank stocks have been, not been bouncing back for 20 years, right? The, the, the percentage, percentage of the S&P that was bank stocks 20 years ago is way higher than it is today. The allocation to bank stocks and financials in general has been going way, way down for a while because they're not sexy and they're more complicated. So I, I, don't, I think it's going to probably take a larger shift in mindset, Pete. And that shift in mindset goes back to what we talked about before, which is people hopefully need to, to develop a better sense of risk reward. I agree. Okay. So we got, we're, we'll, we're both in agreement that we're in a bubble. I think we're both in agreement that again, we have to ride it until otherwise, which actually that's a big thing that a lot of people don't understand as well is how do you tell the difference between a retracement versus a change of the sentiment? which is obviously getting deeper into your trading strategy. Make sure that the reward is likely not hopeful for the risk that you're choosing to accept. Uh, and then there are some stocks out there that you just mentioned that are still relatively valued, if not well valued, to maybe take a peek under the hood and uh, start to time some entries into some of those positions. I do like Schwab myself, actually. I don't have a position there right now, but I've been, I've been hawking that one right around 50, 55, waiting for that to wake up a little bit out of that area. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a tremendous business. They're not going away. They're not going out of business. They have to issue some equity here because people are going to mark to mark assets that are 30 year, that have a 30 year duration today, um, which I think is an unhealthy activity. Um, you know, whatever. Uh, but it's not enough to justify the deep discount people have put on the valuation as of late. Yeah, 80, 86 down to 45 in about a month and a half. Unjustified, you know. Again, that that's the other side of the market. It's not all fun and games all the time. This huge amount of capital, especially in a market that's you know in, a, in an environment that's a little bit less liquid, right? They have taken some of the liquidity, they've taken some of the punch bowl out of the party, uh, but you know that just means that you got to take it from somewhere else. They're taking it from Schwab and banks. Any other story stocks that you've been reading about lately that you're like, ooh, that's an interesting one, but I wouldn't touch it. Anything along those lines? I mean, the NVIDIA thing is, is, you know, you were prescient on that. We talked about that a couple of weeks before it actually sort of took off. And we've, mm -hmm. we've done some a few reverse DCF case studies um, on that that we've shared in our webinars and, and on, in our Society of Intelligent Investors. 
that's just still a mind boggling level of performance baked into that stock price. Um, we also like JP Morgan. That's what we've been looking at. There's a lot of energy stocks that we're very bullish about as well. We think we're in the beginning of a good, strong energy cycle. And, and when you look at the macro, all the macro predictions, Pete, showing that fossil fuel consumption is going to be, I think maybe joked about this in one of our first webinars. How much lower is it going to be 50 years from now, from today? It's like 10% lower, right? So this idea that the fossil fuel businesses are going away is just, it's an unproductive allocation of resources in the present that's going to make the the legacy energy companies even more valuable because all we're doing is killing supply you're like going to saudi arabia and just writing them a check hey all your competition you know we're just going to kill it off because we're going to replace it all with you know uh <laughs> fans and and um and solar farms in which just doesn't work yet um and so uh yeah there's a lot there's opportunity there too i think warren buffett agrees with you now i think that was a big part of the conversation uh was about a month ago not even at his conference where they started talking about how they were building into energy positions and people were starting to say well that hasn't worked for you in the past and he's like okay this time watch basically yeah. <laughs> so all right covered a bunch of good stuff today uh we'll do a recap david i'll put the stocks that we mentioned today and the topics in the uh cliff notes of today's uh podcast and uh where can somebody reach out to you should newconstructs.com any particular place that you'd like to show yeah, up hit our website we've got all kinds of forms people can fill out if you want more information see demos watch webinars um yeah check us out there it's easy to get get involved if you just go to newconstructs.com okay awesome all right david thank you so much for your time today really appreciate it have an awesome day everybody thank you pete my pleasure